Hey, Internet. Well, here we are. Whoa. And you know, last night as I was falling asleep, I had countless ways I was gonna make this, you know, new back video after being gone, like off the air for almost a month, like super cool. And now I can't remember any of them. Eh. One of them was kind of like this go. I was just gonna do this. What? 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 I mean, now that I think about it, it doesn't seem that cool. Anyway, and here's another thing, kind of a secret. My room isn't soundproof, and so I'm all nervous because there's someone who sits like right out there. And I don't want to get really loud because it's embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, it is good to be here. The last couple of weeks or the month and a half has been really one big string of entire madness. I tell you, never move cross country if you can help it. Just unless you're single and, and have everything fit in one car, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here, we're excited, been an amazing reception we've received. The office is coming along, the house has some boxes still there, but at least kitchen's working, Christmas tree is up, and we're ready to go. What does the future hold? I don't know, but I promise you this, a whole lot more word of God right here, right now, for you. <laughs> That's so cheesy. Am I inauthentic? So today is... This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter AWESOME. The numbers Sweet Action and Issues Etc. Talk Radio for the Thinking Christian. Issues ETC .org. Oh, the noise from out there is just... I don't know what to do. I'm used to being at home where I can like yell at my kids and make them be quiet. <laughs> and today's text is Mark chapter 1. We're going all the way back to the start of the Gospel of Mark. Granted, this is the second week of Advent. Last week we were in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, but we're not going to go backwards. We're going to go forward starting at the beginning. Hey, but I can't believe I'm so nervous about this. Oh, first thing we're going to do today is we're going to give an overview of like the thematic points of the Gospel of Mark because as we go through this Gospel for this entire year, we're going to find that it really is set apart. It's a little bit different than the other Gospels. Even though if you study with the liberal scholars, they'll tell you it's just kind of a rough draft of Matthew and Luke and it was written early by some poor schmuck who didn't really know what he was doing and didn't really understand Jesus or the way that Jesus would be developed by the evolution of Christianity and this whole, you know, religious studies theory stuff. Well, they're just dead wrong. Mark is actually a highly crafted, sophisticated testimony about who Jesus is and what Jesus did in history for you with his own intentional use of the stories that we do know from the other Gospels to tell a, well, a different point, so to speak. For example, if I hold up this little figurine right here, I don't even know if you can see it, but you look at it from this angle and you see a certain figure, a certain character. But what you don't see is what it looks like from the angle I'm looking at it. So if we turn it like this way, you get a different figure, a different character. Now notice it's the same figure, but you have a different perspective on that figure. There are things you can see, things you can't see. This is the way the four Gospels work. They all look at the life, work, person of Jesus from different angles. Same Jesus, different emphasis, and a few twists on who he is, what he did. Nothing actually changes with regards to the substance of the Christ. Yeah? So Mark has basically seven major, I mean there's other ones too, but seven major themes or emphasis that you want to focus on as you read through his book. For him, Christianity is about these seven things. One, urgency. In the Gospel of Mark, the day of salvation is now. There's no time to waste. There is nothing to put off. The end is near. In fact, in Jesus, Jesus, it's already come. Two, secrecy. The world doesn't know this. The world doesn't understand this. But even should you try to hide the gospel of who Jesus is, as Jesus does, the fact is, it's so real, so important, so urgently true, that you can't. Three, authority. Jesus, especially in the gospel of Mark, more than any of the other gospels, is shown as a man with real, ultimate power. He faces down demons, unclean spirits, time and time again, as if they are spoiled children, just casting them away, telling them to get out of his face. He takes on nature and all all of its raging storms, just quieting it to a whisper by saying, hey, yo, you be quiet, calm down, chill. And it does. When Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark, you hear the voice of God. Four, purity. You are unclean. Humanity is unclean. This world is unclean, filled with unclean spiritual things, people, and demons. Sin is this constant taint. It drips from everything. It's a sticky goo that we just we can't get off us no matter how much we wash. That is how hard we work to make this life clean again. But Jesus is pure, especially in Mark's Gospel. He is pristine. So pristine that 
that when he touches filth, his hand doesn't get dirty, the filth gets clean. Five, cacophony. This means war. When this urgent Jesus brings his secret purity into contact with the tarnish of our world, it makes our sinfulness to broil, fester, and rage. So especially in Mark's gospel, this leads to conflict, struggle, opposition. Jesus is never really accepted in Mark's gospel, even at the best of times. His disciples never get him. His enemies are trying to destroy him from the very beginning, leading us to a rather epic story of Jesus versus the world. Contramundum. Mano e mundum. 6. Singularity. In this fight, Jesus versus the world, Jesus stands alone. There's only one human being in the entire gospel who calls Jesus the Son of God, even though the demons are doing it all the time, and that one human is a nameless pagan soldier who is simply scared to death by the earthquake, rocking the world at Jesus' death. No one gets Jesus. Everyone denies Jesus. Jesus stands alone. He is special, forsaken, vindicated, unique, holy, terrible, good. 7. Certainty. Jesus is also always right, especially in the gospel of Mark. Jesus makes predictions, and these predictions always come true. Every single time. You can stake your life on his every last word. Jesus ultimately has the answers that you are looking for. You, the reader of the gospel, who see the confusion, the confliction, the cacophony, the purity, the secrecy, the authority, you see through all of this that there is this amazing certainty in who this man Jesus is. So then when at the very end the tomb is empty and the women walk away in fear, not knowing what to make of these angels who've told them that Jesus has risen from the dead just as he said with certainty, you're like, whoa, where are you going ladies? I mean, shouldn't there be more? Hey, whoa, I want to know more. That's the point of Mark's gospel. It's a promise that you have total certainty in the singularity of Jesus, purity, which cannot be stopped by the cacophony of our sin. Jesus' total authority brooks no secrecy, but with tremendous urgency comes barreling out of his mouth, God's mouth, in order to reach all the way from his cross and empty tomb through time and space to this very moment even in order to save you, you, a lost and condemned, unclean and uncertain, conflicted and powerless creature. This is the gospel of Jesus, according to Mark. Now, in today's text, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, we see this beginning to go. Look at that monkey! We see this beginning to go. Literally, RK, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as it has been written in Isaiah the prophet. And then a quote from Malachi and then Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I am sending apostello, apostling, the angel of me, the angelos, the messenger, before the face of you, that is into your space, who he will prepare the way for you to me. And that word there, prepare, is kind of cool because it's different than the word prepare that's going to show up in another verse. Kataskuase. It's not the most common word in the world. And actually, if you go back and look at the Septuagint, the Greek version of Malachi's text, it's not the word Malachi uses either. This is a word that Mark is using to translate Malachi's idea into the present. Dynamic equivalent, as it were. But here's the cool thing. Ever since about 350 BC, this particular word in context with the word hados, or way, to prepare the way, has been used as something of a technical term to describe how one makes ready to worship Zeus. I mean, like, whoa, dude, prepare the way of God? This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus. A messenger sent to prepare the way of God. Verse 3, a voice calling out in the desert, the wilderness, place of demons. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way. Um, make straight his path. With this quote from Isaiah and Malachi, Mark is not only pointing us back to really the entire Old Testament, what well, we don't have time to get into today, but he is linking us to that this is nothing like unexpected entirely. This is something that, well, we've been waiting for. And now beginning with what comes next. He is here. John begins it. Who? John. Well, Mark doesn't tell us much about who he is. It's assumed that you know. John came baptizing in that desert and preaching a baptism of repentance into the forgiveness that's sending away the destruction and divorce of sin. Now, there's a whole host of places you could go with this, but right off the bat, we probably just start with the idea that this baptism that John is doing is not something John is just making up. Baptism in the New Testament age had been a Jewish practice, a Jewish ritual, a tradition of the fathers, for several hundred years. What happened was, whenever somebody who was not a Jew wanted to join the Jewish community, they and their family, including their children, would be baptized. This was part of the ritual purification of making someone who was a God-fearer into a official God-fearer, a Jew, not by blood, but by conversion. And it was not uncommon. This happened quite a lot. It was by baptism that they were made clean of their paganism and brought into the one true faith. But here's the crazy thing. Guess what John is doing when he's out by this river? Who is he baptizing? Jews. Now that's just weird. Mark's not going to get into this too much, but it is kind of cool, kind of important to check out. But what Mark does say is that this baptism is connected to two things, repentance and forgiveness of sin. Hmm, interesting. 
Now, big question, is this the same baptism that Jesus gives or is it different? And actually, in the history of Orthodox Christianity, you will find both answers being given. I'm not so sure. I think most recently, most Lutherans, at least in the Missouri Synod, have come along the lines that this is different. This is not the baptism into the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. But yo, John Gerhard, I mean, you know, kind of doctor father of third generation Lutheranism, he was pretty convinced it was. What is clear is that whatever this baptism, it is precursor to the baptism we have and this connection to repentance and forgiveness should certainly go right over into the baptism which now saves you according to St. Peter, which buries you and raises you in Christ according to St. Paul. John came preaching a baptism into repentance for the forgiveness of sins, a life of, I'm sorry God, I know that I'm unclean. This is no secret to me anymore and with great urgency I need your authority to release me from my guilt. Pardon me from my shame. Whoa, that's a full rainbow all the way. As John is doing this, all the surrounding countryside of Judea and all the people from Jerusalem were going out to him. I mean, not only is he doing this crazy thing of, of baptizing you know, Jews, so even people who don't want to be baptized are going out to him, but, uh, well, people are actually repenting. They're hearing the call and they're saying, you know what? Things aren't so good. I'm not so good. We need some help. Heck, you see all these demons running around, all these unclean spirits casting our children into the fire and making people sleep with pigs and cut themselves with stones? I mean, uh, things are, are looking bad right now. I mean, uh, mass hysteria, cats and dogs sleeping together, real end of the world stuff, you know? So they're all going out to John, out by the Jordan River in that wilderness, and they are ex homologumena. Hey, that sounds familiar. From homologeo, to like word, to speak words together, to speak one word, to confess, to credo, to say the same thing. This is what the faith is all about. And what were they saying the same thing about? According to Mark, they were confessing the sins of them. They were talking about their uncleanness, their need for repentance. And John was dressed in camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt wrapped around his waist, and he ate honey out of the field. That is wild honey. Cool Greek word there, agron, related to the word agriculture and the word field, but which can also mean savage. <laughs> so he's dressed in camel's hair, and he eats savage honey. You could sell that. Savage honey. Savage honey. <laughs> And he preached, saying, He comes, not I come, not you come, he comes. Who? One who's stronger than me, but who comes after me. One who's greater than me, yet comes following me. One who is before me, and yet is younger than me. Not really this, the one who I am not, ikonos, can mean able or worthy, but really means like insufficient or incomplete, like as in you have a, a bowl you're trying to fill up and you just don't have enough to put into it to fill it up. You can't reach full capacity. I do not have the capacity to stoop down and untie his shoes. Not just I'm not worthy, not just I'm not good enough. It's if I were to try, I'd fail. Those are some shoes this guy must have. <laughs> no doubt, feet made ready with the gospel of peace. Ha, dink. What does this mean? This means that while I am baptizing you with water, he will baptize, will wash you with the spirit of holiness. And that's where our text ends for today. And it does kind of leave us with an interesting question. Well, what is the difference between this baptism with water and this baptism with the Holy Spirit? Is there a difference? Well, is there a difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism or not? And where does all of this meet? Here's where you got to trace more than just this particular text, especially if you're going to listen to Mark. Where does baptism meet Jesus in Mark? It happens in the next verse. Ha, look at that. In those days, Jesus of Nazareth came from Galilee and was baptized by John. And when he came up out of the water immediately, oh, there's your urgency, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice said, you're my son. Rock on. I like you. And that Spirit immediately and even secretly drove him out into that same desert, where he would face the king of demons. And from that point on in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is going to be using this spirit-driving, almost possessed authority to cast out demons left and right. Like bam, 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 bam. Washing the world with the Holy Spirit from his mouth. Now, if this was all that we had to go on to talk about, say, baptism in the Spirit, we certainly would think it was nothing but a word issue. The thing is, there's just a lot more text than Mark chapter 1, and we don't interpret Mark chapter 1 by itself. We interpret it with the entirety of Scripture. Let all of Scripture speak together. And so we know from St. Paul and St. Peter and St. Luke and also St. Matthew, really, that baptism is more than just the word of Jesus' mouth. And yet we know where is the power that unites with that water that is baptism coming from? Ha. That mouth of God, that real ultimate authority, that urgently pure Jesus, who in fact is the one that is speaking those words 
or is when you are washed in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is the one uniting you to himself, to his cross, where he does get baptized ultimately, even in Mark's gospel, the baptism he can receive, the baptism of wrath for your sake. And with that, yo, I think we're kind of out of time. Uh, this is going to take some getting used to. If if I feel, if it sounds like I'm quiet or not quite as up as I usually am, it's because this new room has just got me kind of wigged out. Although, you got to admit, uh, upgrade, yo. Yeah. Soundproofing? That was, I'm going to miss that. But maybe I'll get over my weebie jeebies <laughs> and just start. Um, I can't do it. I want to yell, but I can't do it. I'm just there's, just, there's people right there. Just crazy. All right. So, yo, all right. Keep sending email in now that we're back on task. We got tons of stuff coming up in terms of We Team Answers as well. I'm going to have some of those up today even before this video gets up. And uh, with good form, we will see you on Friday.